as we're creating digital products or in any other uh, area of human endeavor, we often base our business decisions, design decisions, development, and marketing decisions based on metrics, based on numbers. And it's clear why we do this, uh, because it's very easy then to see how we're doing, whether we're doing better than we did in the previous time frame, or if we're doing better or worse than our competitors. Numbers, metrics, give a very clear answer to the question, have we achieved our goals? And this is great, I'm not against numbers, but sometimes if we focus too much on the numbers, we lose the attention, we take, it takes our attention away from how our products affect and impact the actual humans who use it. So sometimes uh, we may ignore so-called edge cases, or sometimes in pursuit of higher numbers, such as engagement metrics, number of downloads, number of registrations, number of sale, conversion rates, and so on, we may engage in some borderline unethical behavior like using dark patterns to increase those numbers. And this often, often happens in te the tech world, usually, uh, when some of the big tech giants does it, then there's a big news story about how they did that. Uh, so I'm sure you've heard a lot of these stories. I'm just going to highlight a couple so you can, I can refresh your memory a bit. Uh, sorry, can I just get the clock going? <laughs> Thanks. So Google. Uh, it, it, they had many blunders across uh, the span of their work, and one of the more recent stories was uh, the use of Google location history. So in case you're not familiar with it, when you open Google Maps on your mobile phone, it then asks you to enable uh, Google location services. What it doesn't tell you is that it also enables Google location history, and it saves all your location activity. Supposedly, uh, what they said is that they doing it so the users could access all their previous location history, which sounds great, but lots of users don't even know that it exists, and they don't even know how they can turn it off or on at will. It's on unless you turn it off. It's not very easy to find, and it's not very easy to control. There are not a lot of features that enable you to control how your location history is saved. So they're clearly not transparent about the way they develop this feature. They don't respect the user's privacy. So they got a lot of flack in the media for that. Uh, social media has a lot of examples. So I'm just going to highlight Snapchat, but social media in general, uh, often has features that hijack you, uh, people's brain mechanisms for reward and punishment. And it works similar like the casino slot machines. So one of the Snapchat's more controversial features are so-called streaks. And a streak is when you send a snap to a friend every day for consecutive days. And when you miss one day, then you lose the streak. And as you know, lots of teenagers use Snapchat, and this makes teenagers go nuts. So they try to maintain high streaks, and th it results in them sending blank messages to all their friends every morning so they could keep up their streaks. And if they lose phone privileges or they have to go on a trip, they then give their friends uh, to maintain their streaks. Uh, so as we see, it's not really improving the quality of communication about the users of Snapchat. Uh, actually, it causes a lot of anxiety and a lot of competitiveness, which are not very healthy. So this is just one of the many examples of uh, how social media in general is causing a lot of anxiety in our communications. Uh, and all for creating greater engagement at least uh, in a numeric sense. Now, if you're one of the investors of these huge companies and you're only concerned with profits, then this might sound like a great idea. Yeah, let's inflate those engagements and sell advertising space. But if you're a digital creator who truly cares about your work and you want to do 
work and live with integrity, then if you keep working on these products and these projects that are not very ethical, then it becomes hard to look yourself in the mirror. And so for that, we need to focus on how to maintain our integrity uh, and how to live according to our values. So, which brings me to today's topic. What are values, anyway? So some of you who were in the keynote, you heard a definition of values, so just a quick refresher. Values are our strongest principle or standards of behavior that govern our choices. We act based on our values. Now, in a personal sense, uh, values are what we most want to experience and express in the world. And lots of people don't maybe know what their values are. It's not something that the knowledge that they were just born with. Uh, usually you have to do a bit of digging, a bit of uh, like introspection and personal development to get and to realize what your values are. For most people, values are unconscious unless you do work to make it conscious, which also Mr. Jivorad uh, here explains how values work on a personal level. So in our careers, usually when we're not satisfied with our job or we find ourselves in a career where we just don't find a lot of meaning, usually this means that there is a value mismatch between our core values and the values of the workplace where we live in. So that will usually prompts people to drastically change their career or to move on to another job, even though the previous job was well paid. In a business setting, we have organizational or team values, which are shared among all the team members, or ideally, they should be shared. Uh, and just a minute. So this is the slide for that. So uh, val values are a part of the mission, vision, and values trifecta. So mis uh, mission is why we exist. Vision is where we're going in the future, and values are what standards or behavioral norms are expected of everyone who is collaborating in this team. So uh, if we have everyone on board, then decision-making is a lot easier. And uh, this is the quote for uh, Mr. Late Roy E. Disney, who said decision-making is easier when you know what, what your values are, because then you have something to measure your decisions on, and you're sure that when you make a decision, it was the right one. It's not the one you're going to regret. It was the best decision for you or the best decision for your team, no matter what people outside of your team may think about it. So uh, we have lots of values but just a few top ones are our so-called core values, the ones that are the most important and that impact our decisions the most. Uh, now, when it comes to building teams, we need to realize that values are affecting our entire company culture very much. They're one of the top influences on our culture. So when you're looking for, to bring new people into the team, you need to check a bit if they're the right fit. Now, usually when people hire uh, new team members, they're wondering whether their skills are up to the task, and the inevitable question, are you a team player? But what does being a team player mean in the context of your team? There are people who may share your values and then they will fit into your team, but maybe if they don't share your values, they won't fit and they won't be a good team player for your team, but they may be excellent team players in a completely different team. So be careful about this team player questions. I mean, everyone can be a good team player if they're into the right place. It's important to pay attention to these values fit with your company. So ideally, when you're looking for new team members, you're looking for people who do have the skills that you need, but also there is the overlap with the values that they share. Now, uh, some companies, uh, Zappos is one of the more prominent ones, they find core values so important that, uh, for example, they require every new team member to sign a document that they've read the company core values and that it's now expected that the, respecting these core values is now a part of their job description. So Tony C., who is the founder of Zappos, he says that it's important 
to commit to these values. And this means even hiring and firing people based on those values. Usually when we think of like company values, we imagine that the founders of these companies are the ones who make them. And that is for many companies very true, especially if the business was very small and then it grew organically. But some companies uh, choose to examine what their employees think and create these collaborative values together with all the people in the team, which is exactly what Zappos did because they introduced core values a little later into the development while they already had a bigger team. So if you have a very small team, you can have like a little internal workshop where you find what people think and you get to a consensus about these values. When you have a very large team uh, where it's impossible to get them all in the same room uh, discussing, you can have a poll that everyone like fills in and then you gather all these responses and find common threads, common themes, and then a, a little key team is going to develop these values from those all, all of the different opinions of all your other employees and create something that every employee in the company is willing to stand behind. So core values can help you engage your team to make them better employees because uh, usually what makes people engaged is finding meaning in their work. If your employees, or maybe you, if you're an employee, if you're a team member, if you know that what you do is meaningful, then you're going to show up with more energy, with more enthusiasm, and you go the extra mile to do the work. And if you're if you don't see the meaning in your job, if you're just going there for the paycheck, you can become very disengaged and it ends up, uh, the company loses because of that. So uh, Mr. Richard Barrett, is a, he's a consultant who helps large organizations develop core values and to introduce them to everyone in the company. So from the top leaders to the people on like the lowest rung who are doing work with the customers, so in all the levels of the organization, these values are expressed. Everyone is expected to adhere to them. And this makes for a very, very engaging workplace. So even more benefits than having engaged workers is engaging your clients or customers. Authentic values that you demonstrate through your product and through your brand and your marketing uh, create deeper relationships with your clients. Your, uh, your, uh, attract a loyal audience that cares about your product or your work more than they care about other companies that, and other products that they purchase because uh, they don't have that emotional connection with them. So shared, re shared val values build relationships both among people and among people and companies. And in a 2012 Harvard Business Review study, they found that from all the uh, customers uh, asked about this question, that 64% of them named core values, shared values, as the primary reason that they have a relationship with a brand. Now, of course, not everyone has a relationship with a brand, but you probably have a brand in mind that you do feel like you might have a relationship with, whether they're like a big company or a small company, they matter to you for some reason, and likely reason is that you share certain values with them. So core values can become a crucial part of your brand and marketing strategy if you implement it into what we call an ideal client avatar or a, a customer avatar or our user personas. So beyond just focusing on the demographics, like age and gender and uh, location, etc., we also focus on their emotional world, on what they care about, and then this gives you greater access to empathy for these people. So you can create products and features that they truly care about. Uh, now, how do you find your values? If you see that this is something that could be valuable to you personally or in your business, I'm gonna give you some pointers how you can access those, how you can find out those for yourself. Now, if you're a freelance consultant or if you're just interested in a professional and personal growth in general, these are some of the questions you can ask yourself. So what made you want to become a designer or a developer or whatever you do? I'm sure it wasn't just money. So it was 
probably something that sparked your inspiration before that. What annoys you in your professional world? Sometimes focusing on what you don't like and what you don't want can point you in the direction of what you do like and you do want. If you had all the money you needed, what would you change about your career? Maybe you wouldn't change anything, but maybe we would change something small and see what that thing is. Maybe that can point you toward your values. In a business or a team setting, uh, so some questions that you can ask your entire team to chime in on, to find your common core values. Why did you decide to create your product? What made you see the need for it? Why do you think that now is the right time to create that? What do you want to achieve through this product and your business for yourself and for your customers? And more importantly, why you? What makes you uniquely qualified to offer this to your customers? What would you never ever sacrifice, no matter how much money, approval, or fame you've offered in return? Now imagine some big investor or a tech giant decides to buy your company. What would make you categorically refuse their offer? So once you have your core values, it's not enough just to put them on your company website. You need to use them because they can be very, very practical in your decision making process. How you need to be careful about the decisions that you may not be making right now that maybe you should be making because even when you don't make a decision, you're also responsible for the consequences of not making a decision as Luhan from Spotify is so nicely summed up. So four areas that we're going to look at, at right now. Uh, so first of all, first of them is business strategy. So that's the top level, uh, usually finances and uh, the overall role of your business and the world. Uh, Luke Holden, who is founder of Luke Lobster, uh, emphasizes that you need to stick to the values you decided to, even if it makes you lose money, because sometimes uh, earning more money is just not worth losing your integrity and losing your customer's trust. Bottom line is not the end all be all to making good business decisions. So here are some questions from the business side of things. Is our business model aligned with our core values? Now, some business models are predatory. Is your business model healthy for your users as well, not just for your business? Are the KPIs we're measuring merely vanity metrics or do they show our commitment to our values? Will this new product further our core values or is it a distraction from them? Sometimes killing the product is the best decision you can make. Uh, the other area is product design and development, how we make our digital artifacts. So psychologist Janelle Evans uh, points out that core values address how we use our emotional intelligence in our work, uh, in addition to using our intelligence and our technical expertise. And the university professor Helen Nissenbaum, uh, who is an expert on values in design, she points out that we put our values into our technology. So technology is never neutral. It comes up with values that are embedded into it, and then this technology perpetuates these values at a greater scale and affects a large number of people. So we need to be able, we need to be careful about what we're putting into this technology because that is only going to get emphasized uh, as more and more people use it. So some questions to ask ourselves are, is this new feature we're considering aligned with our values or would it go against it? then if it would go against our values, that feature may not be a good idea, even if users are requesting it. Do we have any features that were implemented for short-sighted reasons that caused intent unintended harm? Yeah, cut those features out. Is this feature taking into account so-called edge cases and the experiences of marginalized groups, like people we don't normally maybe meet in our office? Are we taking their needs into account? And are we actually uh, expressing our value of inclusivity and accessibility on all the levels? Does the interface design and copy demonstrate our values? Visuals and language matter. So be very mindful about how you use them. 
And the third area is branding and marketing strategy, which happens to be my area of expertise and where I do the most of this work. So every action you're taking to get your prospects' attention tells a story about your brand. It also speaks about your value. So whatever you put out there, whatever marketing message you're putting out, it, get, it makes an impression that you know, maybe you haven't thought about that as strategically as you should be thinking about to get the message that you truly want people to receive. Some of the questions you can ask yourself are, does our brand voice and our tone or how we communicate with our customer, does it express our values? Are you condescending? Are you empathetic? Are you friendly? Are the visuals on our website or app aligned with our values, such as photos, illustrations, icons, and video? Are we communicating our values effectively through our advertising and content marketing? What might be the unintended negative impact of this marketing campaign? So many marketers never ask themselves this and end up in hot water. Now, fourth area is customer relationships, and I don't just mean answering tickets. I mean actually caring about the impact on your users. So do we have an easy-to-use feedback system that enables us to hear our users' concerns? Are we holding ourselves accountable to our users? And how will we apologize and make amends when we mess up? Because we will mess up. We can make many, many mistakes, but it's not such a big deal that you made a mistake. A bigger deal is how you handle it. And people will forgive you making a mistake if you address it correctly. So some examples to maybe inspire you uh, to see how this can be done in the real world. Uh, first one is very old school, because they've been doing this for a very long time, and HP influenced a lot of the Silicon Valley uh, companies. They adopted their values in their own uh, companies, which HP came out with. It's called the HP Way, and it's also described in a book by one of the founders. So supposedly they're not really following this way anymore, but while they did, it made it caused great success of HP. And uh, David Fraden, who was a f uh, former uh, product manager both for HP and Apple, when asked in an interview what he learned, what was the biggest lessons that he learned while working at HP and Apple, was the importance of values and the importance that individuals' values and companies' values match. So that when you get into decision-making room, that everyone is on the same page and they are using these values to evaluate their decisions. Now, a slightly newer example is Issue, uh, which has uh, the Issue principles, which you can find uh, in one of the articles that I found on their website. So I'm not sure if this is company-wide or it's just the engineering team uses this principle because it's very engineering-specific. And uh, Soren Wind, which wrote this article, uh, points out how we really need, they really uh, use their values in their everyday decision making. And this includes uh, choices of te technologies and their process that they use. And this causes a lot of uh, great feelings about the work. Everybody's engaged, everybody's uh, very, very enthusiastic. And he says they get results, number, numeric results for their work, and it results also in great co code quality. So it has very practical effects as well as emotional impact. So the article that you can find, uh, they really broke down how this works uh, with specific principles in their work. It's on their website. Another example is Just Works, uh, which is a platform that manages payroll, benefits, HR, and compliance for bigger companies. And uh, their values are so-called cogis, camaraderie, openness, grit, integrity, and simplicity. So uh, they use their values in all of their work, like the strategic work, the marketing work, but also we, I saw a little uh, video case study where they used it in visual design. So they developed a set of icons for their interface, which you can see looks quite different from what we're used to in enterprise software. And they took great pride in creating inclusive icons. Uh, so, for example, there is this little cute uh, thumbs up with a cast on uh, for 
workers insurance and there's a very gender and uh, ethnicity neutral bird family so they took very careful steps of communicating this inclusivity and to add a bit of lightness uh, to situations that may be very sensitive and sometimes challenging uh, also uh, kanban uh, method has its own set of internal values like understanding, agreement, respect, leadership, flow, customer focus, transparency, balance, and collaboration, uh, which uh, is explained in great detail in this article, introducing Kaman through its values. So you can check out how that works uh, with them. And Mike Rose, who wrote the article and who wrote a book, expl uh, explains that Kanban is not just a productivity tool. So it's a management method built around a strong framework of values. So values, they're all about values. Now, I hope these examples will inspire you how to employ that in your own teams. And I want to emphasize that while values may seem like a very abstract thing, like something up in the air and very ethereal, they can become a very powerful tool for creating not only profit, but also positive impact in the world. So I invite you to use all your design and development superpowers for good in the world. Thank you.